Hi everyone, um, my name is Israel and this is a talk about engineering and working with engineering for PMs. So let's dive right into it. Um, so this is kind of a little awkward. I was actually supposed to do this in a, as a uh, live in-person event back in April and then all this global pandemic happened. So uh, this turned into this event, so I'm gonna do my best. Um, I'll summarize this slide. The PLDR of it is that I used to be an engineer and an engineering manager until I turned to the dark side and became a product manager. And this is mostly talking about some insights that I have both from my life as an engineer and engineering manager and then my life as a PM. So my time was spent about half and half as engineering and on PM side. So a little bit of disclaimers, what I'm hoping to achieve in this one and what this is not. Um, I phrase this mostly as a letter to myself from 10 years ago or five, 10 years ago when I started as a PM. These are my own opinions, they're not my employers. Uh, these are tips that would work for my past self, but you know, there's more than way, one way to be a good product manager. Uh, and for those of you all, if you're listening to this, then you're, you don't have to listen to this caveat, but this the last line is mostly written for people who are just going over the deck. Uh, the, without the voiceover, it's only maybe 40% helpful. So if you are planning to take this just offline and look at the deck, uh, take a look at the speaker notes as well, is what I would recommend. All right, so why is this topic interesting to me and why I think you should um, be curious about this topic? This, this, this topic. Um, I would say that Eng, without exaggerating, is your single most important relationship. Um, engineers can be 10x or more, uh, less or more productive. And when I say productive, it's not necessarily about just about writing code. It's about being engaged, doing the right thing, with the right motivations, and being happy to work with you in a long-term way. Uh, and if they're not happy, then all of your strategy and all of your execution chops and all your work with your designers are not going to be helpful. Uh, so it's really imperative that you have a good relationship and productive relationship with engineering. So we've established that it's important and it's uh, probably the single biggest determinant of success, especially early in early career. Um, but it's also, I've seen people struggle really really mightily. Uh, so engineers would would pretty constantly complain about being either streamrolled or not guided enough by, by their PM. So it's a really tough balance to strike. And also it's the, in terms of the raw knowledge that you need, raw kind of hard knowledge that you need, it's one of the more demanding parts. Uh, I know those of you who are looking to transition into product management, a lot of you are dreading the technical interview um, and a lot of PMs have come to talk to me in the past for this. So I'll try to shed some light onto the um, technical knowledge that you should have as a PM to be successful as a PM. And some of this will translate to also tools that are helpful for a technical interview, but not all of it necessarily. Uh, and last but not least, I personally had some spectacular fails at the beginning of my career. So that, and that is despite coming from an engineering background. So I really had time to um, think through this and understand what are, be, what are some ways to avoid some pitfalls because I fell into those pitfalls myself. All right, so as a PM, you are hopefully already accustomed to thinking uh, in terms of your audience. So let's put some sort of uh, engineers' personas and try to really empathize with how they, they view the world. Um, so let's start with the first one. In, in new grad, imagine you finish your four years in Stanford or Carnegie Mellon or you know uh, any uh, CS school. Uh, so here is like the mindset that you come to it. The, you're thinking that the last two years were, were really fun. You want to work on really cool stuff, make a change in this world. Uh, and you especially if you're coming to, in, in the Bay Area especially, where you're coming to one of these companies, um, these bigger companies, 
it means that you actually had a lot of options. So you didn't have just one offer, but you probably had multiple offers or multiple paths to, uh, paths to multiple offers. So you have this sense that like, you really, you're really excited coming in. Um, so let's fast forward uh, maybe four or five years. Um, you're kind of like, I would say, um, early to mid career, you have some experience, you think about stack and we'll get to what stack means in a little bit. Uh, but you think a lot about, oh, this, the stack that I work in is actually pretty important to me. You're trying to develop some sort of direction, uh, be that front end, back end, more mobile, more machine learning, more back end, these kind of things. So that part is, is important to you. You already have some sort of direction there. Um, you're also probably thinking a little bit more about development processes. And that means that you were, uh, you were in at least one, if not more projects that sort of, uh, failed uh, or didn't go the best way that they could because of development process that were not good enough. You probably spent some time on code base that was not very good and that slowed you down. So you are determined to not repeat those mistakes. Um, so um, you're a little bit disillusioned. You know, if you, if you were kind of star starry eyed at the beginning, as a new grad, you're like, well, I mean, software is cool, but it has its realities. You understand those re realities a little bit more. And you're also, if especially if you were good, and those of you who are fortunate to work with really good engineers will experience this more, is they know their worth. And they know that they are, um, at any point, they have options, be that inside a company or outside a company. So they are, uh, sometimes people use the term entitled, but I would say, uh, may, perhaps if I would have to characterize it, I would say it's justifiably entitled because their talents are worth a lot in the marketplace. And uh, they have, they're motivated and they want to do things the best way they can. Uh, fast forward another four or five years, uh, that's like what we call like senior developer already. Um, they are, they're, and they probably go in one or the two paths, either more seasoned individual contributor uh, or a manager. And the seasoned individual contributor, like sometimes they'll be like these Uber TLs, uh, these guru type people, and they'll think about the systems and the process and really kind of how to optimize and leverage productivity for everyone. They will really, really care about the software um, engineering craft. Um, and on the manager side, they will care a lot about how to uh, sort of nurture their employees so that they can have successful career paths. And what's really the thread that I want to connect across all three is that they have option options throughout. So it's really on any given day, they could uh, one of the things that is incumbent on your company, your product is to make sure that you are still the most exciting place for them to work at. Okay, so now we've taken their issues of, and these, this is, I'm dating myself, this is a uh, Pikachu and Raichu and a Pokemon kind of joke. And if we flip it to the PM side, this is how you can be perceived as PM. And that, I can tell you this because that's how I perceived PMs when I was, uh, an engineer and engineering manager. So at worst, especially if you're a new PM uh, who does not establish credibility, you can be perceived as this person who is trying to say, pe tell people what to do, uh, whereas they don't know kind of what they are doing. And that is the worst place you can be in. Uh, I've seen people um, get like the kiss of death. The kiss of death for PM is to be at some level ignored by your uh, engineering counterparts, uh, and it's like, okay, well, we'll do the, the minimal thing that will that makes sure that we're not in trouble, but we don't, we don't, you know, uh, we have different ideas on what we should do, etc. Uh, at best, uh, you can be a really, really powerful ally to them, and they would, when that relationship works best, then you are, um, you'll, it'll be actually like a quite magical. You'll be a respected partner and, and equals in a product creation. You know, you're. Um, and I think that is actually a really big compliment that you're considered as equals because let's remember that they are the ones who are doing the actual writing of the code. So 
being equals in a product creation is actually a great aspiration for us as product managers, even though we are sort of uh, responsible for the direction of the product and where it should go long term. All right. Um, so um, pause here, and, and there'll be three sort of aspects of working best with engineering that I will uh, go over. The first one is going to be about chaos, and we'll dive deep into it. And then we'll talk about a little more technical aspects and then a bit more of the personal aspects. So the first one is minimize the chaos. So the story I always say is that when I was an engineer, I would think about PM as an agent of chaos. Like there's a trope that says, oh, my PM changed my requirements at the last minute. And that is like one of the biggest complaints. Um, after I turned PM, my first realization was that oh, I'm not creating the chaos. I'm just sort of representing the chaos that is inherent in the environment. Like, I'm not changing the requirements. It's either that the users didn't like this and uh, some sort of UXR or the leadership changes mine or some dependency team decided to not do the dependency. So we have to do this. But there's like chaos in the world that just sort of goes to engineering. Um, and then a little while after, I realized that actually, uh, the chaos does exist in the world, but our job as PMs is to minimize the chaos and to synthesize the world the best that we can to make sure eng engineering gets less chaos and is able to um, to focus on the actual work. So that is our like our first job. Like that's a PM one hundred one minimizing chaos and or order from chaos. You might have heard that. So this is a, a very old, like maybe at least like 15 year old kind of uh, comics before I think there was a very robust PM craft uh, in the tech world. Uh, but this is a, what I'm trying to say is that this is a timeless problem, having a, a customer problem and connecting between that and what engineering should do. It's a, it's a timeless problem. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we have to do, but it's what I, what I want to take this is it's, it's, it's a hard problem that is worth solving. So the first thing you can do is on a high level, have a really, really good idea of where you're going and why. All of the tactical prioritization, uh, MVPs, et cetera, is not going to be good unless you have a pretty solid, like it doesn't have to be necessarily well-defined uh, in terms of just all the I, all the things that are cross and I dotted, but you should have a really good idea of where you're gonna be a good vision that if everything works out well, how is life looking like in three years? And then a sort of one year roadmap. And again, as it sort of trails to the, uh, to the, the fourth quarter, it can be, a little less defined, but you should have a generally kind of three-year plan and then a three-year vision and then a one-year plan of what are, what is it that the things you want to do and, and, and at least in the, in the big blocks. Um, I would also spend some time learning how to write mission, vision, strategy, and objective docs. They are, these four are separate things, uh, but oftentimes I've seen PMs or sometimes even engineering managers kind of use as a broad level, like, this is the things that I want to do in a, a high level and not in a quarterly level. So I would really recommend learning how to do that the best way. And there are, there are, there are good books. The one that I recommend is Inspired by M Marty Kagan. Um, yeah. So, and if you have a hard time tying like the quarterly work that your engineering team is doing to a mission, a vision, a strategy that ladders up all the way to what you're whole product is doing and what your whole company is doing, then you can ask for help from your manager. And your manager, like yeah, especially earlier in your career, if your manager comes and gives you a task and hey, you should do this, you should do that, then you should have, uh, you should probe your, if you, if you are not inherently bought into it, then you should talk to your manager and prod him to give you deeper answers until such time where that you are, um, you understand how it ladders up to the strategy and you are confident and you believe it in yourself.
So kind of contrasting or a duality that exists with what I just said is all the above. You don't do this in some sort of secluded room and go to your monastery and just like spend a week and come up with a white smoke of like, hey, I have vision, I have strategy. Uh, kind of uh, Moses coming down from our, from Mount Sinai, that kind of thing. Uh, everything should be developed in partnership with all your counterparts. Uh, and most importantly, engineering. You want to, like by the time that it's put in, into a dock, it's all am ambient ideas that were already out there. You just kind of formulated them and you've sort of um, brought it to the world, but it was all the ideas that were going around in the organizations. And if it's not that way, then you want to actually create those opportunities for Eng to influence or talk to them when it's when the ideas are still a little bit half baked. Um, that doesn't absolve you from having to produce like a good solid mission vision strategy, but it's okay if it takes a little bit of time. Um, you want to minimize surprises. Oh, by the way, I should mention um, a lot of this deck is actually uh, me going out to my to engineering counterparts that I work with in the past and asking, what is it the one thing you would want your PM to know? So I took like four or five those and I weave them in here. And one of the things that, that they kept repeatedly mentioning is, oh, like share with us the idea, not just the, the, the thing that you want us to build next quarter, but give us the, the sort of longer term plan for each and everything. That would allow, that would give two things. One, it would minimize surprises. And two, it also uh, maximize opportunities. So your engineering counterpart might have a simpler idea because you're thinking like, oh, uh, I want to do X, but I think that's going to be too difficult. So let's do Y instead. No, you want to actually talk about what that big thing that you want to build is because they might have an idea for a simpler solution to it. Uh, and last but not least, uh, build consensus. You just your, you know, you, if you have like there could be occasional cases where your engineer isn't bought into something that you're trying to build, but that should be very much the exception. And especially early in the early in the road, then you really want to dig into why they they don't they don't think that it's the right thing to build and try to address their concerns. Uh, this is a really important one. Be unambiguous. Um, you want to write, and there's a link in like the, the art of writing uh, PRDs, uh, project requirement documents, but you want to be as you know straight as you can with it. Like you don't want to leave too much room for uh, oh, like you want to solve all the problems and actually ask your engineers to give you the feedback if it is not. Uh, if it is not an unambiguous enough to tell you when it happens so that you can kind of catch it because any parts of ambiguity in, in PRDs uh, or in mocks or in any sort of artifacts that you're creating can, um, it can essentially, if you don't catch it in time and the wrong thing gets built, or at least there isn't a good understanding of what is the right thing, uh, then the cost of fixing that is orders of magnitude higher than the cost of doing, getting it right from the first place. The second thing I would say is, is just prioritize. And this is a, the, an ask that you will get aggressively. Hey, hey, can we get a stack rank of all the prioritization um, of everything you're trying to do because you want to do too many things. And your natural response, if you're a, if you're a good product manager, you probably have some, some amount of bias for action. So you will want to do more things just viscerally, emotionally, you'll want to do more things. You'll care about each and every one of the projects or efforts that you have, but you have to prior and, and you'll try to shy away from prioritization. Oh, like, why do I have to say, should we do A or should we do B? Can we just, can we just do both? Uh, but you need to be ready for prioritization. Uh, and last but not least, track progress. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to work with a program manager counterpart, they might handle some pieces of this, but in absence of that, it, it, it's it's incumbent upon you to make sure that the progress is being tra tracked properly, and you um, you know you're you're sort of understanding and finding all the pitfalls ahead of time. 
All right. I think some of you might have heard this. This is the concept of a shit umbrella. And it's, I think it explains very well what it is, is there is in the organization, there's a lot of randomization. There might be a lawyer might come in and say, oh, the feature that you want to launch, I'm not sure you can actually launch it. What you want to do in those cases is, again, minimize chaos for them. So that is to say, if, you, if, 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 if your product counsel comes and says, oh, I'm not sure if we can do it this way for this uh, HIPAA compliance or whatever, then before you get engineering, you like forward it to engineering, like, oh, what do we do? You want to talk to the product counsel to push back or understand sort of like, well, what is the way I can do this with minimal disruption to my engineering team? If a dependency team comes and say, oh, I don't have this uh, ability to do this um, in the timeline that we've suggested before, then before you sort of randomize your engineering team, you want to say like, okay, well, is, what, 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 is, what, is our, what are our options? And you want to get it really, you ultimately need your engineering team's input and decision, but you want to bring it to them as the most process way that you can. Be like, hey, all right, this thing happened. Our options are one, two, three pros and cons here, which one should we pick? So you want to really minimize their time so that they can keep productive on everything else. All right, so that was number one, kind of doing your job as a PM and minimizing chaos. And the better you, you know, most of the uh, PM books you'll read, um, the mom test, shipping greatness, all that stuff, uh, inspired, uh, lead startup is going to focus on the on that first part of how do you sort of reduce uncertainty and, and minimize chaos in the organization. Um, the second part is about sort of spe speaking the technical language, and I think this, in terms of interest on this part, you're, you're, all, you're all going to have a pretty bimodal response to this. Those of you who are either CS grads or engineering grads, hopefully this will be. Uh, not hopefully, certainly this will be not news to use and you may even want to skip forward uh, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, those of you um, who are, those of you who are not, then you will have actually a lot of, uh, this will be new and this will be probably challenging. Um, I would say if you, if you're not in, uh, if you were not spend time in CS and, and these things, strike you as new, then you should spend more time learning about this area. Uh, there's different ways to do this. You can have a lot of material online. You could also try to um, play around with a few personal projects. So I would really, if you didn't have any opportunity to do so, just spend some amount of time getting your hands dirty with code. There's a lot of really good online resources to do that. Uh, and the insights you will have on the development process as an engineer are gonna be invaluable for you. So I would really recommend doing that. All right, um, so what's a pull request? You might have heard this call a diff or a change list. Um, a pull request is essentially a change to the code base. That is to say, uh, changing the color of a button, that's a, probably a pretty simple pull request. You're changing a string in the code someplace. That's another simple pull request. You're adding a whole new feature. That's probably actually multiple change lists that are landing, um, you know, at the same time. Um, and so each one of those is taking the, the, the current state of the code and modifying it a little bit. Um, so what, what you need to know about these is that that's, and that's the, those are the primary artifacts of engineers. Those are documented. Those are available for everybody. Like on GitHub, you'll see like a whole bunch of those in you know, and you can sort of look at the code and look at the differences between the between every two versions of the code. So that's the prime, that's the currency. The same way that your currency is your uh, is your PRDs, product requiring documents, then this is the engineering primary artifact. So what you should know about these is uh, they are, first of all, they need to be uh, created and takes time to, to get to, to create, obviously. 
and they need to be reviewed, oftentimes reviewed by another uh, another engineer. So it doesn't, it's not enough that engineer an engineer wrote the code for something. They also have to get this thing out, get it reviewed. Uh, they have to run tests on them. Um, so that, that takes time and sometimes like, oh, I thought this was ready, but it was actually not ready. It took me like a week to, to submit it and to finish the, uh, the pull request. Um, it could be rolled back. That is to say, like you submitted it, it's in the code base in the master branch, uh, but if something went wrong, so it can be uh, sort of rolled back. Uh, and then those take some time to actually deploy. So there is between when a change is committed to the, the code base until it actually hits production, like in front in hands of your users, there's actually a deployment process. Now, the deployment process will vary from place to place, but it can take, depending on where it is, um, like a mobile phone, a mobile app versus on uh, online versus a uh, backend, that can be days to weeks. Um, it used to be even like months and years, but thankfully we are in a much more agile development process. So, but it will take some time to deploy. And there are different environments like there are staging environments, production environments. So like there's all these nuances. So I would really recommend uh, talking to your engineer and be like, hey, can you walk me through what happens from the moment that you change like the color of a button all the way until our users see it and have like a really solid mental model for that? Uh, because that's gonna explain, to, especially when there are tactical decisions to be made of like, oh, do we want to get this change in before that launch, that's going to have help you have a, a good common language. So that's a poor quest. All right, so this is a really fundamental one, and I would encourage everybody to read more about this. It's not if it's not kind of obvious to you. Uh, and um, I'll use backend and server interchangeably, and frontend and client interchangeably as well. And, but there is actually a, a nuance between the two, which I'll get to at the end. Um, so, fine. So, backend, backend is code that runs on servers, usually on AWS, or Google Cloud Platform, or Azure, but it could also be on some dedicated machine running anywhere. Uh, that is to say, you know, your your the person who is running the code, your user, it's not running on their machine or on their phone. Um, so if you think about it, then what are some things that, that would, that would traditionally run on a backend, uh, a bank transaction. If you're like depositing something, something saying to the data database, okay, is has, um, 2000 more dollars in his bank account. You can't do that on your phone. You have to go and tell the bank servers that a Google search, Google search query, you're not running that search query on your phone. It just goes to the servers. Of, of Google, um, and these are like the most obvious things. So as a rule of thumb, any type of heavy computation, any type of searches in database, any changes in database, uh, anything heavy is gonna be done usually on the backend. So on the front-end side, it's like front-end and client is actually the, the, what you see, the actual bits and pixels. And it's it's run locally, like the client side means that it's run locally on your computer or you know, on the user's um, uh, computer or phone. So it's usually the more lightweight stuff like form validation or manipulation of, of you know, like, like toggling on and on and off. Uh, if you're, for instance, running a calculator, then that's all on the front end. It's not going to the server. Um, you, you can know whether something is client side by if, if it works offline, then it's not talking to do to the cloud in any way. So it's all uh, it's all client side. Uh, like a game that you, if you're playing like Monument Valley or any sort of game that is not multiplayer or cloud, it that runs offline, then that's usually all uh, client, all front end. Now you might want to save game state for that purpose. You might go to the cloud and do the back end work, but um, you know it might also just save it on the client side. Uh, and there. I'll address the nuance a little bit, but don't really, really don't sweat it too much. Uh, but um, all, almost all, 
all front end code is client side, but you can also have some back end stuff on the client side. Technically, you could have you could run a local database. You could save your your game locally. You could, if you have a calculator that is all on the client side, you might still like there is maybe a back end small server that you're running on a client side that just does the actual computation. Um, so almost all front end is client side, but not everything that is client side is necessarily technically front end. That's a small nuance. Um, but for sure, if you were doing any work that requires permanence or, or, or working with multiple clients, that is the user can jump from their phone to their laptop or to another phone, you will have to go to back end. And an important thing for, for engineers, an important thing to know is uh, just kind of like, you know, there are different, two, two different types of uh, uh, front end. It can be native, your iOS or Android app, or it can be the front end on a web page. There are, it's a different tech stack. So the, the languages that you use for front end and back end might not be the same. Um, there is, again, a, a nuance there as well with Node.js and some others, but uh, largely people will um, oftentimes will say, oh, I'm front end or I'm back end. Some will say I'm full stack, which means I can do both. Uh, but even that, like, you know, you want to know sort of what's which type of engineers and or, or they will have one for day. Uh, the things to keep in mind for each one of them for, for web front end, uh, testability is important. Performance, oftentimes you, can, you, you can't put things on the front end. Uh, because of performance issues and responsiveness issues. Um, the native, on native side for, for your apps, the one thing to take into account is that your release cycles are going to be a lot more difficult. That is to say, uh, on the web front end, um, let's say you change, you, you submitted a pull request and uh, you have it, you, the, the button is now red instead of blue. On web, that will hit production, this, as soon as it hits production, then it's going to be available to everyone. On native, it will actually has to be, um, it will take days, if not weeks, for that to happen, just because of how release cycles work. Um, and on the back end, usually, perform, like people are trying to do really performance stuff, so it, it can create long, long development cycles. Yeah. And you should have a solid idea on who of your engineers are more front end, who and who are the back end, and um, definitely, and, and you know that there is a difference between the two. All right, let's talk about tests. Um, so um, you know you, you probably have heard engineers talking a lot about tests, and this is we have this term called code complete, uh, which is oh we think that the code is written. But then there is um, a lot of time spent on writing tests. Uh, so I'll try to use a car analogy here and, and, and explain the different types of tests. So unit tests, start from there. These are the very basic tests that engineers develop, essentially uh, to make sure that the smallest piece, the smallest piece of their code works, like they're, the, to make sure the building blocks themselves work. So imagine you're building a car and you have like a, gasket or a piston or whatever, and you're stressing testing that thing in a factory before saying, oh, this can go into a car. So it doesn't give you a car, the confidence that the car will work at all, but you have to make sure that these happens because otherwise, if you turn on the ignition and the car doesn't turn on, then you don't even know where to look. So that's that sort of unit test, making sure each component works on its own the way that you expect it to work. Um, and those are just, those would happen, there wouldn't be too much coordination, like each engineer who is writing the code would also write the unit tests that go with it. And a standard part of development. Um, unit tests are gonna be, um, sorry, integration tests are gonna be uh, ensuring that um, two or more pieces work together nicely. So again, going back to the car analogy, if you have a valve that is connected to a piston and you wanna work, make sure that those work together. It doesn't help to me that like the piston passes stress test and the valve uh, has its own. You got to make sure to connect them and say that it, it works. Um, 
in our case, it's going to mean that if you're if one you know, one piece of code calls another, then you have an integration test that tests both. These will fail in a surprising amount of the times uh, because you're like, oh well, each code is doing what it's specified to do, so it's just kind of connect, you know. And it, it turns out that no. And uh, an organizational insight is the farther are the two organizations that have built the two components of the system, the more likely it is to fail. So if these are two, like if these are two engineers who are sitting on the same team, likely it will work because likely they, they're like, oh, hey, look, did you do it this way, did you do it that way. What do, what do you think? Um, and if it's on the other extreme, two other companies trying to interact on an API, it will almost certainly fail at the first time because there will be some just different unset assumptions that were done while developing each one of those things. Um, so integration is really important, time consuming. Um, Equipped with these two, uh, you can sort of start that like, oh, things are should just work essentially. And it's probably true. Um, but at the same time, you wouldn't trust a car that a car actually works just by checking every component and that making sure that every two touching components work. You want to turn on the ignition and see that the, the car runs, right? And so that's the end-to-end -end test. Uh, you're just making sure that everything works. Um, now, if you're doing back-end work, you're and like you're doing like an ML kind of uh, sort of service or a payment API or what have you, you're actually done there. You don't need to do UI test because you don't have UI. Uh, but if you have front end stuff, then there is a one last addition, which is you kind of want to make sure that the UI is tested end to end. And it, it is almost like a kind of an end to end to end test to do, uh, but it like we outline it as a different type of uh, thing just because um, it is a little bit different in its um, it's a little bit different in how you do it it's as opposed to all the other tests which are essentially making some calls to code and making sure it outputs what you want and the UI tests you actually have the automation of it is actually uh, quite difficult so you have like these uh, frameworks like selenium and, and others do um, do these things, but only, and you could also do them manually from time to time, and that is sort of that's going to give you the last sort of sample of reward confidence that everything works. All right. Um, last but not least, um, this word tech debt you might have heard about it, technical debt, um, and it's the way I would describe it this way. Uh, imagine you can. Um, Imagine you heard that engineer says, oh, I hard coded this thing. So there's like the right way to do this or the wrong way to do this. Or, um, yeah, uh, I struggle to come up with an analogy, but like, these things can happen at, at work, at, at home too. Like rather than organizing something properly or, or, or building some, um, some desk properly, you decided to cut some corners. You know, it's going to take a little bit. It's not going to be as good. It's, it's going to be, it's going to, create additional work for you in the future, but you just don't have time to take care of it right now. So uh, the technical debt. Um, so so at any, sometimes, and like multiple times a day, probably this happens to engineers, um, there will be the right way to do something or the, the wrong, the quick and easy way to do, to do something. And you sort of, you can choose to kick the can down the road and say, hey, we're going to address this later. We're going to consciously take on this debt. Or we're going to make this choice. And it's absolutely a legitimate choice to do. Um, and you should do it from time to time. It's just when they speak about that decreasing their velocity in the long term, then this is this is what they're what they're talking about. So the rules of thumb is when Eng cringes a little bit, like that is say you propose to do this like the easier way and they're like, ah, then it's okay. It doesn't mean that you have to stop necessarily. It's just be mindful of that and don't do that too many times. It's sort of, it costs your, the bank account that you have with your engineering counterparts. Um, I would say in, in the long run, expect to spend maybe 20% of your time to be spent on infrastructure. So because it'll be like quarterly planning is gonna come and your engineers are going to be like, oh, we, we need to spend like this much time on just repaying, paying off the technical debt uh, from before. 
Um, and you should like have a good framework for that for engineering, like what's acceptable long-term debt service, uh, if you will. Uh, but um, like 20% is probably a good rule of thumb. And you should give within that, you should, uh, you should encourage this. And it's okay if some quarters you're like, well, actually this quarter we're really stressed. So let's do only five to ten percent, but then also make sure that like there are some quarterly quarters that you're not stressed and okay, let's do thirty percent, um, or let's take a couple of weeks that we really go in and go in deep in our info. Uh, and if you don't do these things, what's, what's going to happen is things are going to slow down. Your velocity is going to slow down, uh, and ultimately your engineers might leave you <laughs> if you are constantly putting them in a way where their code base is not one that is fun to work in and they feel like they are slowed down by their predecessor's choices or their former self's choices that you forced them to do, then they're just gonna get frustrated and say, hey, like I, my talents are not being utilized here properly because all the time uh, we're playing sort of the, the myopic game. Sweet, all right. So we talked about uh, kind of knowing your stuff. We talked about knowing their stuff. And last, I want to bring sort of um, the the human side of things, like how how does their their craft look like, and how does their career planning look like. And this is the thing that I think when I went and asked my engineering manager friends, uh, what is the things that the PMs should know? That was the thing that came in most prominently. Uh, I was actually surprised that very few listed technical things. And most of them were like, I wish they just understand this aspect of it. And I tried to like synthesize it and bring it to like one over overarching lesson. And if I had to succinctly phrase this, I would say that it's, it's this, uh, in, um, in physics, you might have learned that distance is equal to velocity over uh, and velocity over time, or velocity times time. Um, and it turns out that it's not like a, as linear as you might expect for engineering. So I'll, I'll explain. Uh, let's call this a fundamental planning, planning fallacy. And it's one that I've seen PMs on all levels, up to director and more, make. Um, we'll sometimes think that oh i have 10 engineers so over 50 52 weeks minus the time that they've taken off blah blah i have 500 engineering weeks so i can just treat all the like i can take the, the vision that i want to implement translate it to like uh, divisible chunks of work scope each one by engineering weeks and then i can just pick and choose from that bag of things and each one of them has a has, has a price tag and so long as some of the price tag is less than 500, then it's good. And I can shift investments. I hear just like, oh, we want to, we might want to shift some investments from here to here. Um, that's a, it's an, it's an incredibly naive mental model that breaks so fundamentally that uh, it's uh, probably best to forego altogether. And I'll explain the four ways in which this mental model breaks. So this is the mythical man month uh, uh, issue, which is uh, um, the quote that goes that nine women can't make a child in one month. Some things just don't parallelize. So this is the Dilbert bit that you're seeing like, oh, if, I, if you add more projects towards end of the project, it actually slows the project down. So you're like, oh, I have this my most, I really have to get this. What can I do? Can I just get two more engineers, three more engineers? Sometimes the answer will be yes, in a surprising amount of time, the answer will be no. And that is oftentimes frustrating because leaders are like, we are willing to put all, like uh, leaders will say, we are willing to put all the effort uh, on all the engineers and all the investment. Can we just get you more engineers? And they will be frustrated to hear that the answer is no. The answer is that there is nothing that could make this project uh, take three weeks instead of four weeks, except for like working weekends or whatever. And even that might not be necessarily helpful. Um, so people don't like hearing that, but you are, it is part of your job to represent your product and your engineering team properly to leadership and say, hey, like, actually this is a product that more engineering will not help. So that's, that's number one. That's, that's one way that the 
uh, distances, velocity, and, and time um, fails. The other one is that engineers are not fungible. I have a football reference here, but um, you know, a person who's supposed to play wide receiver cannot necessarily play defensive lineman well. Like they wouldn't even be good necessarily. So the stack matters, the expertise, the level of expertise matters uh, because a person who a new grad and a person who's been doing this for 10 years, it's not the same thing. A per, uh, and um, also the context matters. So some people know a certain code base. Generally, the person who is more most involved in the code base is most likely to be efficient with. Now there are um, sort of some there are these development philosophies that say, hey, actually, let's let's have collective code or code ownership as much as possible, so that uh, people can jump into uh, others' code, and that's that's a healthy dynamic. But you have to make sure that, that is one that exists before saying like, oh, let's pull this person to do this thing. Um, but uh, yeah, um, and. Also, when we talk about uh, front end and back end, it's not that you know people go into the careers and, and that's the only thing that they do, uh, and they, they didn't. They can you know a back end engineer can no longer do front end or vice versa. They could potentially retrain or do or do more, uh, but it would require a them one thing to do this and b take some time. So if you're trying to make four weeks into three weeks, that is not gonna that is not the solution. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, my recommendation, especially as a PM, is rather than trying to move one engineer here, one engineer there, let's pull this person like the from from this project to that project. Just get them connected to the mission and let them figure out the how and and partner very very closely with your engineering manager counterpart, uh, rather than just trying to like play a chess game or like I'm moving this person from here to here and these kind of things. Um, so the cathedral building, the story here goes, um, a person walked into um, my three brick three masons who were laying bricks, and they asked them, like, okay, what, what are you doing? And the first one said, I'm laying bricks. The second one said, I'm building a wall. And the third one said, I'm building a cathedral. Uh, or um, there was a quote goes that JFK was uh, visiting NASA, and he asks, uh, janitor, what is their job? And the janitor said that, hey, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. Um, so a really important part of how good is the velocity is actually, are your engineers, A, motivated about this and B, understanding what they're building? And that's helpful because um, like, if they're, if they understand what, what is it that they're building, they A, built the right thing, they're, they're less likely to interpret the PRD in a, in a wrong way um, or um, yeah, just do the wrong thing because it, it, something didn't make sense. And B, they'll be more motivated. They'll, they'll understand what is it that they're, they're building on a very high level. So uh, just do this really, like you can't overdo this in my, in my opinion. You want to, uh, if you, it pays enormous dividends to do everything that we talked about in the first part, getting clear PRDs, and at the same time, getting them involved from the beginning, if you're doing any sort of, if you can get, for instance, your users, in, your um, engineers in front of your users, if you go into a UX study session and get them to um, bring in an engineer and seeing them, seeing a user interact with it, it's going to A, build motivation and B, whenever there is like trade-offs that they have to make, they're going to help them make the right trade-offs. So, yeah. You really have to, you know, believe in what you're doing, evangelize it, and 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 this is like play the cheerleader part. All right. Um, so this is the the, the fourth way uh, that it's really important, and it's not just distance is lost in time. Um, people have, especially in bigger companies, people have different career paths. So. I'll, um, Give you an example. Um, if you have the coolest project ever, it will be for a new grad or even in a different stages in, 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 in people's careers. It would be a great project, cool, lots of impact, good technology, all that stuff. Um, 
but you're pulling if you're pulling some some other engineer who is uh, a new engineer into the team, uh, but that engineer was actually six months away from their promotion cycle, and it's actually um, they really needed to finish the project that they were working on. That is going to be very very annoying. They're not going to be a happy camper, despite the fact that your project is cool and everything else works. Uh, they were not going to be a happy camper. So. And, and then if they're not going to be a happy camper, remember to the very, very basic premise, which is they have options. They can go to another part in the company. They can go to another company. So I would say, uh, remember the fact that everybody and, and your engineering manager is going to remember this, just kind of like empathize with him and, and your engineering manager is going to optimize at some extent with this to make sure that everything aligns with people's career specs. That's, um, so just, just empathize with your engineering manager there. Um, and I would say a churning in and out of project can really blow back. Um, you know, people can be very unhappy about this. And I would say, uh, when you're optimizing, especially don't like do micro optimizations for, for the project at the expense of people's careers. Uh, what you really want to do is try to really harness the same, that energy that you have for like, oh, uh, um, I think this is a very cool project. I think we need more people on it. So rather than, do using a crude hammer, like, hey, let's pull two engineers. What you want to do is just generate excitement with your EM, generate excitement in the engineering organization. And over time, uh, if you're high on a, aligned on a high level, it's going to pay off and it's going to, you're going to get, eventually you're going to get to the more the allocations you want, but it might not have happen in weeks time. It might happen in, in months time frame. All right. So that is actually it i'll go through the um key takeaways from this um the first one is and it breaks down sort of the, the three um parts of this talk the first one is just pm 101 know your shit take the time to understand your product and what you're trying to do deeply you really cannot uh bluff engineers like they they have they're very very good bs detectors so if you're like, you're doing something because your manager told you that that's an important thing and you don't believe in it yourself, they'll smell it and they will like, they will be that much less motivated to do it. So you really want to be, to have a really solid understanding of every single thing that you're asking your engineering to do. How does it ladder up to ideally company strategy, all the way to company strategy? Uh, and at least you know, in, in a bigger company, maybe to the product strategy. Why is that an important thing? And have a really, really good narrative for that. So that's that's the first one. The second one is speak the language. It's a, this is a non-issue if you're a CS grad or if you spend some time uh, coding at all. Uh, but really have a basic understanding and be curious about the day-to-day -day technical aspects of their work uh, so that you can help with trade-offs. Uh, when they come to you like, oh, we could do this, but actually... Uh, this would would have to move from this release to that release, blah, blah, blah. You need to have a basic understanding of how what that even means so you can have a good understanding. You can help them because this is part of you helping them. And third and probably most important in terms of your relationships, especially with your engineering manager counterpart or your technical lead counterpart, uh, this is not velocity and time. Um, you, it's not a linear thing. You can't just say, hey, I have like 500 weeks of engineering and I just have to figure out how to allocate them the best way. That's not how it works. You want to think about in terms of, think about it in terms of mandates, think about it in terms of large, uh, large alignment. And, um, how do you like work with your, with your engineering managers so that the investment, the product investment and product outcomes, uh, and, uh, career needs come together and not just kind of, one at the expense of the other. Um, that's it for me. If you want to hear it, read more, there is there is really good, uh, really good content out there. The first one by Tom Eisenman has all most of this content and so much more. Like this, an endless uh, rabbit hole that is that you can spend probably weeks going into it. Uh, Domestical Nanomans is a is a classic book. It's a little dated, but it's, uh, it's nevertheless has, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's a good thing to read on. Uh, 
Uh, and Joel and Software is Joel Sapolsky is a software legend, uh, good blog. Again, also predated, but it's like more of a classic than anything else. All right. So uh, yeah, I'll uh, feel free to comment in with questions. I'll try to answer them in batches from time to time. And you can find me also on uh, Twitter or just an email if you have any issues on, on LinkedIn as well. Thank you.